Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hello, everyone. We are officially in the final week of daily coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Obviously, the fact that we're ending this daily series after this week has nothing to say as to how the broader war is going or just the broader area, just the recognition of the fact that doing almost 30 plus days of episodes is definitely a good time to hit other topics for the realignment, but we'll be sure to continue covering this area as well. So you can definitely write in with any thoughts, comments, reviews, anything like that if you want us to hit other topics related to this moving forward. Today's episode is a really great one. I'm speaking with Seth Jones. He's the author of Three Dangerous Men, Russia, China, Iran, and the rise of regular warfare. This topic then is focusing on this idea that regular warfare is a strategy of approaching war against the typical conventional way. So this is a great follow-up to our episodes on counterinsurgency. This is a great follow-up to last Monday's episode with Sean McFate, where he was critiquing conventional war. So this is about irregular warfare. And what's really interesting to note here for folks is that originally, irregular warfare was supposed to be the way that rising powers would actually use to fight against the United States. And what we're seeing in Ukraine is we are pursuing an irregular form of warfare against Russia. So we get into the way those are operating on the ground, how it hits there, all those other great things too. Quick note for everyone as well, we would love to get comments and replies from folks, especially as we transition out into these broader Ukraine topics. So if you have any thoughts for stories you'd like us to cover, even in the end-up way we've been doing that, be sure to reply and email us at realignmentpod at gmo.com, or you can also go check out the Substack as well too, which comes out on Fridays. Now, a quick note, a bunch of people have also asked how exactly the tipping function works. There is a link in the show description or a link if you're watching this on YouTube, and you can click on that link and give a tip there if you like our content. So for all that, let's get into the episode where we like this one. Dr. Seth Jones, welcome to The Realignment. It's great to be on. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the most direct question I can ask you. What is irregular warfare? Well, irregular warfare is warfare below the threshold of conventional warfare. So what it, the easiest way to think about it is it's not forces operating set-piece battles on a battlefield or uh, navies fighting each other like the Battle of Midway during World War II. Um, there are at least four elements of what I uh, call irregular warfare. The first are information campaigns public diplomacy, psychological warfare, disinformation. The second are support to state and non-state partners. So the idea here is that you're not fighting a country directly, you're using proxies or partners. The third would be covert action using intelligence units. That can be because uh, uh, using offensive cyber operations, or it could be paramilitary uh, uh, efforts, but it's done under essentially intelligence uh, auspices. So uh, that's covert. And then, and then fourth is economic coercion. Uh, so efforts to influence uh, uh, adversaries using essentially money, uh, uh, economic assistance, and then using that for political advantages. All four of these aspects of, um, of irregular warfare uh, are designed to weaken an adversary and strengthen yourself as part of balance of power competition below the threshold of uh, conventional war. I like your four definitions. And it seems like every single thing you described from the info campaigns to the economic coercion reflects what we are doing in Ukraine right now in terms of the United States and NATO partners. Is that, is that a correct way of summing it up? A absolutely. I mean, the, uh, the, the most significant way I would describe what the US is doing and, and NATO is doing in Ukraine, it's not fighting the Russians directly. It's using information campaigns. It's supporting a state entity, the Ukrainian government. It is almost certainly conducting covert action and, uh, and that it is using economic sanctions against uh, the Russian state. So uh, uh, again, much like the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, we didn't see those two uh, directly fight each other for fear of escalation to nuclear war. Instead, what we saw is the heavy use of irregular operations. And Ukraine is a textbook example of this. And in fact, the president of the United States said explicitly, we are not gonna fight the Russians directly. 
in Ukraine. Uh, we're not going to send in forces. Therefore, it's below the threshold of conventional war. And I really, really enjoyed your book, Three Dangerous Men. I think it may have come out a little bit too early, given the timing of everything. You've definitely earned the paperback copy here with the, I'm sure, extended, extended afterward. But let's just discuss the narrative, because once again, the, the, at least my interpretation of the book's narrative is the U.S. is faced by these three specific challengers, China, Russia, Iran. Given our conventional strength, and given the nature of the specific conflicts we were in with them, either directly or indirectly, irregular warfare was their strategy to compete with us. So it must feel a little strange that just five, six months later, the glove is on the entire other hand. And now we are the ones who are engaging in irregular warfare against a conventional foe in the sense of, of Russia's actions in Ukraine. So you just talk about the pendulum swinging here. Yeah, uh, the uh, the it's, it's been interesting because um, the when the 2018 National Defense Strategy comes out uh, that uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Jim Mattis puts out under the Trump administration, then the Biden administration uh, comes in and continues along a similar line that the focus is no longer uh, counterterrorism post 9/11. Uh, the focus is on state-based adversaries. The, the assumption had been that uh, for, for many that the US then needs to focus on these big conventional wars in, uh, against either the Russians or the Chinese. And so, I mean, I participated in many of them myself, war games, both classified and unclassified, uh, Russian invasion of the Baltic states, a uh, uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan, or potentially as big air sea battle in the South China Sea over control of islands. And uh, you know, I started to push back to say, actually, for the reasons you just outlined, plus the reality that, uh, that the, the US, the Chinese, uh, and, and Russia have nuclear weapons. So conventional war has tremendous risks involved in that, not just the economic destruction, but the potential escalation to nuclear war, where you're destroying chunks of each other's populations. I mean, that makes states ex extremely cautious. We have never, ever had uh, two nuclear powers go to war with each other precisely because of, directly through conventional means, precisely because of the risks of escalation. And so what I had written about was how the, uh, the, the Russians, the Chinese, and even the Iranians uh, are looking at competing with the U.S. through irregular means and how the U.S. needed to focus on irregular responses to that. Well, as you fast forward to February of 2022, the Russians conventionally invade Ukraine and the U.S. very quickly is back playing an irregular game in, in Ukraine. So we sort of are in a position where we now have to make some of the recommendations that I'm making in this, uh, in this book rather quickly. Yeah, and, and we'll get to those recommendations in a second, but I wanna spend a few bits on just the terminology here, because even the word, obviously you're, you're a national security defense policy expert. So when you use these terms, they have specific meanings, but if someone who's just, entering this space as many listeners are with, if they hear the word irregular, it sounds as if it's not the norm and conventional or regular sounds like it's the norm, but on a historical basis in recent history, most conflicts to, to this point are irregular. So is there just a point where if we're trying to think through these issues and come up with policies, we should maybe explore using different terminology? Well, there are a couple of different terms that kind of fit into this genre. Uh, the uh, U.S. Cold War uh, State Department uh, expert George uh, Kennan called uh, this concept political warfare, or something along these lines, political warfare. Uh, it's the, the term gray zone activity has been used, or asymmetric, even unconventional. Um, I have used irregular warfare in part because that is US military doctrine. So it's already been well defined. But I do think there is an important 
additional aspect of your question, which is, a, it's a, first of all, it's a great question. But second, I think what is most important is not to get wrapped around the axis too much of what one calls it for two reasons. One is, I think a lot more, what's most important is the types of instruments of power that states are using. And that goes back to your, the, the discussion of information and disinformation, uh, the covert action support to non-state um, and state proxies and then economic coercion. But there's an additional element, which is um, how other countries define it is different. So the Russians mm. have used terms like active measures uh, or maskarovka, denial and deception. The Iranians have used terms like jung inarm, soft war, as their own term. The Chinese have used various aspects of son jung janfa, or three warfares, to describe this. And there's one interesting other component, which is, you know, as I had a range of people review the uh, various drafts, I had some pushback uh, from folks saying, well, I don't think it's best to use the term warfare, because what warfare means is, is violence. And the reality here is twofold. One is that, uh, that, that these countries use the term warfare specifically to denote uh, items that are much closer to what Sun Tzu calls the achievement of objectives without fighting. So this is, this is a lot less like Karl von Clausewitz, if people have read, you know, sort of that Prussian military general's book on war, and a lot more like the Chinese uh, general and historian Sun Tzu. So it's a very different type of warfare, and it can involve a great deal of nonviolent actions to weaken an adversary. So the warfare component is also an interesting one as well. I'm so glad you brought up the Sun Tzu or the Clausewitz comparison because. And once again, you don't do this in your book, you haven't done this there, but I've just noticed a frustrating retreat to just national stereotypes when it comes to describing any types of these types of conflicts. So Sun Tzu, the Chinese are wily and they're smart and they're planning, they're playing Go, we're playing checkers. The Russians, the Russians have shown through World War II that the Russians will sustain casualty after casualty after casualty. There's just this very reductionist discourse when it comes to different cultures, different nations, different ethnicities fighting themselves. So how do we, when we're organizing our thought around the Star of Warfare, around different conceptions of what a country even is, how do we not, how do we remain analytically rooted without going too far? Well, I think what the, the there are a couple of key components. One is you have to understand, uh, you have to understand these countries. And that means, uh, that means reading what they write, translating. Um, and I actually think, you know, the Chinese actually do it pretty well about the US and the Western world, which is they, they translate large amounts of documents in English, newspapers, for example, translate them from uh, English into Mandarin. And then the, one of the, the largest circulating newspaper in China is a compilation of foreign news sources. The U.S. and the West are, are, I think, much farther behind reading what is going on inside of China. Newspapers, um, Chinese television, because uh, a lot of that is publicly available, even translating the, uh, China's science and military strategy, which is the most important uh, Chinese military document. It's unclassified, but uh, if it's not translated, no one, no one reads it. So I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, a second is to study not just what they say, but also what they do. So in the Russian case, it is to, uh, to study how the Russians have conducted operations in the past. I deal a lot with the military realm. So how did they get involved in, in Crimea or in Syria or in Eastern Ukraine starting in 2014? What types of forces did they use? how they conducted uh, covert action, including offensive cyber operations. So it is to look at, at uh, what key leaders have said, and that's part of what I'm trying to do in this book is to translate and read through large amounts of documents from some of uh, the key leaders within Russia 
China and Iran. Now, these are pretty misogynistic societies. So we're dealing with men here. There's a reason this book is Three Dangerous Men is none of them have really influential senior military women, which does say something about their societies, but it's to read those documents and then to look at how they've operated and acted. And it's that combination of what gets said and then what happens that I think starts to tell you what is happening on the other side of the hill as the famous British military theorist and soldier B.H. Uh, Littlehart says, the other side of the hill, what's in the opponent's mind. So let's actually get to that. So as we've established, uh, you write about three countries and then the three and three specific men who have developed strategies to engage in a regular warfare of the United States. I'd like to go country by country, figure by figure, just through the top line of that. Obviously, we'll save some for the book. But let's just start with the most obvious one, which is Russia. Um, who is the figure? Who is he? Um, it's kind of just a quick side note. So often when you speak in this podcasting sense, you have to make things gender neutral. Um, so it's just funny that I'm just like, he, like in this very case, who is he in the Russian case? Um, and then we'll go through China and Iran. So who is he and what specific strategy is he employing? The uh, the Russian figure that I focus predominantly on is Valery Gerasimov, the chief of the army staff. He is a very influential, uniformed general officer within the Russian military. I think what is particularly interesting about Gerasimov, first of all, very close confidant of Vladimir Putin, uh, influential in, uh, in strategy, Russian military strategy, but also in operations and tactics. And when we look at, at, uh, at Grasimov's evolution over the last 20 years in particular, what we see is that Grasimov looked very carefully at how the U.S. in particular was operating overseas in Bosnia and Kosovo in 1995 and 1999, respectively. Afghanistan in 2001, uh, Iraq 2003, Libya 2011. The Russians and Grasimov looked a lot at the color revolutions in addition. And what Grasimov starts to argue over time is that the US is changing the way warfare is operating. And that in cases like Libya and Kosovo and even Afghanistan in 2001, uh, there is an effort to conduct regime change to overthrow the governments, Taliban, Gaddafi, um, and, um, and then to assist the Kosovo with independence with a very limited footprint uh, to primarily focus on intelligence and uh, special operations for forces to leverage local actors. So go back and look at those support to state mm -hmm. or non-state actors, heavy focus on cyber and space-based operations, um, uh, you know, key aspects of information operations in all of those, uh, including getting in front of CNN and, and other news stations. And so the Russians and Grasimov in particular evolved this approach that we see first in Crimea, which is the uh, taking of territory without really even firing a shot, sort of the quintessential example of what Sun Tzu says about achieving objectives without fighting. Then Eastern Ukraine in 2014, uh, be, the Russians begin a war in Eastern Ukraine uh, with uh, essentially uh, utilizing irregular units, uh, Ukrainians that are assisted, armed, funded by the Russian government. And then Syria, starting in 2015, where the Russians don't deploy large numbers of forces. They work with the Iranians uh, and they assist the Syrian government, Lebanese Hezbollah, a uh, non-state organization, militias that have been recruited from Iraq, Palestinian territory, Afghanistan, Pakistan. So quintessentially irregular operations because the Russians are operating by, with, and through other actors or relying on covert activity. Um, and so this is part of where Gerasimov uh, takes the Russians. Obviously, the recent invasion of Ukraine is a slightly different uh, break from that Gerasimov path. And it does raise questions about to what degree uh, 
Gerasimov in particular was involved in making the invasion decision or how much of this was really Putin's call. Yeah, it's interesting. Obviously, when you focus on, and we'll get to China in a second, but when you focus this through the lens of a specific individual, this is an individual that regardless of their power is operating within a military bureaucracy. So for example, David Petraeus during the Iraq war leading up to the surge is a very powerful general, but that's not to say that there weren't institutional folks in the army and defense department who disagreed. Donald Rumsfeld, you know, secretary of defense disagrees with much of the strategy that Petraeus was advocating for. So how do you just think of the idea of these individuals and if anything, the individual's role within their specific context. So let's go with like Jurassic. So a question that I think about here is when it comes to, I don't want to say branding because it makes the work that they're doing seem less substantive, but I kind of wonder like how much of his writing is branding. I am this big, basic, big thinker. And how much does it actually percolate throughout the actual bureaucracy and even up until Putin himself? Well, I mean, what's important about the job of the chief of the army staff, it is uh, arguably the most important uniformed officer in the Russian military. And so what it means is people will listen to him because he of his position in part. Now, as you know, he is not the only uh, influential Russian individual. We, there's, we have the Minister of Defense, we certainly have the intelligence chiefs, SBR and the GRU, although the GRU, the main intelligence director, does sit under uh, Valery Gerasimov. But I do think what you have to do when you look at individuals like General Gerasimov is you have to also step back and look at other aspects of how uh, the Russians are operating. So an example is when we look at Russian irregular operations in the US homeland, there are other agencies other than uh, uh, those within the Ministry of Defense that are operating, including the FBR, the, the Foreign Intelligence Service. So uh, cyber attacks in the US, including Colonial Pipeline, can be done by multiple organizations or hacking organizations that are working with uh, Russian government agencies. Uh, so again, uh, or, or we've seen the Russian deployment of private military companies overseas operating in coordination with the Kremlin or with the SBR or in some cases with the GRU. So what's, what, what, what I've tried to do is look at uh, how important thinkers uh, calculate what they read, what they decide, because Grassmann is involved in operational level decisions, but then look at the broader context of how the Russians are operating, including in other um, in other services, and 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 of course, it's an authoritarian regime. So Vladimir Putin obviously has mm -hmm. an important role in in making decisions, even if he's not spending all of this time just on the military in the military sphere. So let's talk about China then. Um, figure strategy. So the uh, the key focal point uh, for me is the is uh, w one of the most important Chinese military figures, uh, Zhang Yuzhou. He is the uh, vice chairman of the CMC, China's most important military body. One of the few uh, uh, Chinese PLA general officers that has combat experience, two separate tours during uh, Sino-Vietnamese wars. And, and I think what's important in understanding the Chinese is this then uh, gets us to key aspects of how the Chinese have thought about irregular operations. This is, again, below the threshold of conventional and certainly nuclear war. And uh, what's, what, there are a couple of things that are interesting. First is uh, some of the most influential Chinese movies that have come out are actually a testament to this. Wolf Warrior, to the second most watched movie in Chinese history uh, is a Chinese special operator operating not in the Indo-Pacific, in and around Taiwan, but in Africa against who, you guessed it, Big Daddy, the United States. And at the end of that movie, we see the Chinese special operator hero stand over um, a dying, the dying American saying, you are the history we are 
uh, the future. And that is kind of this quintessential example, again, special operator, Africa, uh, enemy is the United States, that embodies what Zhang and others are implementing. I think what's also interesting is we look at the uh, Chinese, they're, they're, if, if the Russian example of seizing territory without firing a shot is Crimea, the closest approximation in China is the uh, South China Sea, is the Spratly Islands. Mm -hmm. And there, what we see is the Chinese don't send in uh, large uh, maritime vessels to, you know, PLA Navy vessels to seize, uh, uh, seize islands or reefs and, and then claim them as Chinese. What they do is they send in dredgers, which take over time uh, atolls, Hughes Reef, Fiery Cross Reef, turn them into islands. And then on those islands, the Chinese build what they have now, which are military bases, signals intelligence or SIGINT platforms, missile batteries, electronic warfare, airstrips where they can land fighter aircraft or strategic bombers. So this is a textbook example of seizing territory through regular means, sand dredgers, and then turning it into a military base in contested areas that are contested by the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia, and others. And then just, just last one last point on the Chinese is, uh, is what's, what's also been interesting to, to watch is how they've used a Belt and Road Initiative, for example. Um, so it's economic infrastructure projects also to build uh, what are now naval bases, Wadar, Pakistan, Djibouti, in, uh, in the Gulf area. Uh, also, they're now building a base uh, on the uh, Atlantic coast of Africa. They've been pushing into the United Arab Emirates. Um, and we've seen, we've seen the Chinese use economic leverage for political advantages to push countries either internally or on the UN Security Council to vote or take positions that are conducive to China in areas of Tibet or Hong Kong or or with uh, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. So again, these, this is an economic coercive element that is below the threshold of conventional war. And I wanna go back to the Sino-Vietnamese reference you made there, because this is something that most folks just aren't aware of. So in, I think, 1979, I believe, the um, China and Vietnam f fight a war. And I think with Russia, at least, because of Afghanistan, because of the Chechnya example people discussed, Syria, obviously, Georgia, were very aware of Russian military performance. But in the reference you made, this Sino-Vietnamese conflict was really foundational. So can you just talk about like what, and once again, it's a Chinese defeat. Um, interestingly enough, after we were recently defeated by Vietnam. So just give the history there. Yeah, so I mean, I, I just briefly, uh, what we see is, uh, is an attempt at a, a large scale conventional operations by the Chinese uh, into Vietnam. Uh, they face pretty staggering losses. They spin it in ways that sound very heroic. But I think the challenge at the end of the day is, this is so long ago in the 1970s. I mean, think for a moment, if the US uh, General Officer Corps only had uh, Vietnam to go by, that would be the last war that the US had fought. Well, obviously that's not the case because as you fast forward into the first Persian Gulf War, into the Balkans and Kosovo, and then into the second Gulf War and Afghanistan and lots of other, Libya, Somalia, but the, the, the reason this is so important, this is the last major uh, war or two wars that the, the Chinese fought. So for a, a PLA general to have combat experience, it, it, it has to be a very senior officer. And Zhang is one of the few that has stuck around this long. And I think that's what actually makes Zhang a particularly interesting character is despite the fact that the Chinese suffered such high casualties, didn't achieve their strategic objectives, it is still one of the few, uh, Zhang is still one of the few PLA senior officers that has still had any combat experience. 
And this is a question which will bring to mind the U.S. experience in Afghanistan and Iraq. How much in these irregular, maybe become conventional conflicts, does experience, quote unquote, once again, saying this as humbly as a civilian, does that experience matter? So, for example, if we have a general staff that earned their stripes in the war in Iraq fighting counterinsurgency, engaging in the war of occupation, does that experience translate when you, let's say, go to a potential Russia-NATO conflict that's much more conventional and escalatory? How much do these types of things line up? Like, how do we think about this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, they, they, they in, in a number of cases, the wars can bleed between conventional and irregular, or at least can give one insights. So think, for example, about a lot of the conventional focus of the US military in Iraq, where it had deployed over 100,000 forces, was involved in the surge in cities like Baghdad. They still faced an irregular threat. The Islamic Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, RGC Quds Force, led by Qasem Soleimani, a major figure in the book. Uh, they are providing assistance, weapons, money to some of the Shia militias operating in Iraq. So. Even if someone is focused largely on conventional operations, uh, they may still deal with uh, uh, irregular, irregular operations. But I think the bigger issue is they don't always translate that well. And so if one is only focusing predominantly on conventional operations, um, the, look at the type of systems involved, you know, big platforms, aircraft carriers, tanks, armored personnel carriers, uh, F-35, you know, fifth generation aircraft, stealth aircraft, uh, war games that involved, you know, large numbers of forces on a battlefield. When you get into the irregular arena, you don't want, you're not using those kinds of platforms, or if you are, you're using them in, for exquisite purposes. You're not putting forces on the battlefield. So the challenges or successes that you may have in logistics, in morale, uh, in, a, in a conventional fight, again, don't always translate into, into an irregular arena. It's a different mindset. I think it requires an understanding that is very uh, different and an understanding of where you're, what country you're operating in that is much different. Um, and so I think one has to be very mindful of what type of area that you're dealing with, conventional, nuclear, or irregular, and, and then to adjust accordingly. But it's very difficult to move back and forth easily. I mean, you're generally talking in the US about different types, even of forces. The irregular forces are generally your Green Berets or your Navy SEALs or your Rangers or Marine Special Operations teams. They can include CIA paramilitary. In a conventional war, they're big units, 82nd Airborne, 101st. Uh, so, you know, different types of forces, platform systems. And they, again, they don't always translate that well. So you mentioned Soleimani, so let's close out the three men with discussing him in Iran. So Qasem Soleimani, is the uh, uh, or was the head of the uh, of the Islamic Rev Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, the paramilitary arm of the IRGC, uh, which is, as its name actually suggests, was created in 1979 because uh, uh, the uh, the Iranian Supreme Leader did not trust the Shah's military, so he wanted to create his own Revolutionary Guard. Uh, which would be much closer, closely tied to the Supreme Leader. And the Quds Force is the paramilitary arm. Iran is a very weak conventional military. It doesn't, at least yet, have nuclear weapons, which means this is Iran's bread and butter. It uh, is irregular operations. And so Qasem Soleimani, uh, over the last 20 years of his life, uh, spent his time providing assistance to Lebanese Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, uh, to Iraqi Shia forces after the US invasion, catastrophic invasion of 2003, uh, groups operating in Afghanistan, the Houthis in Yemen. And what 
Soleimani does is he recognizes that whether it's uh, directed against the US or the Iranians have other enemies, the Israelis or even the Saudis, the Iranians can't compete through conventional warfare. They're just too weak. So they provide assistance to partner forces and they actually do fairly well. Hezbollah does a reasonable job against the Israelis in 2006. We see the Houthis active against the Saudis, uh, including today with missiles, standoff capabilities, um, and other technologies that are more irregular in, in nature to, to target the US, to target the Saudis, to target the Israelis. So that's the bread and butter of Qasem Soleimani. And so again, one of the areas that really got him on the uh, target list of the US was to provide assistance, including sophisticated improvised explosive devices, what are what are called explosively formed penetrators. These are shaped charges that killed a number of US soldiers in Iraq. Again, not directly by Iranian forces, but could force uh, uh, provided a lot of the technology uh, and components of those EFPs to Shia groups operating in Iraq that then use them against the uh, US. So in January of 2020, uh, during the Trump administration, the president ordered the targeting of Qasem Soleimani when he landed in uh, at the uh, Baghdad International Airport. He's killed by US Special Operations Forces. And so we then have this transition from Soleimani to Ismail Khani, who's the current head of the IRGC Quds Force. But Soleimani is the embodiment of Iran's use of irregular warfare. And the Soleimani death point brings to mind an obvious question, which is the rules when it comes to irregular warfare. So once again, there was significant controversy around his killing. And if you're going to argue that the EFPs, for example, were a contributing factor to the decision to um, have him killed, how does that impact how the US arms Ukraine or other partners? Because a let's just say that numbers wise, the the javelin, the stinger, the the weapons that NATO partners are also are contributed to the country are, are are devastating in the same way the EFPs are or were um, in, in cities. So how do we how do we think about whether or not those contributions could provoke a reaction? Well, two things. One is the general approach by major powers in irregular warfare is not to target state leaders from your adversary directly. Uh, it's, you know, again, one thing to do it indirectly through proxies or, or whether they're state or non-state proxies or, and partners, but not to do it directly. So the U.S. killing of Qasem Soleimani, the most influential Iranian military commander, was an outlier. Uh, it was, and it was heavily debated by the U.S. In fact, in my conversations with U.S. military leaders before that strike, there had been multiple opportunities to target Qasem Soleimani, and the U.S. had decided, just from a cost-benefit calculation, it. It, it wasn't worth it because it was gonna invite an Iranian strike against US general officers as, as well, the, the possibility at some point down the road. But uh, uh, so even in Ukraine, I think the, with the US providing assistance to Ukrainian forces, I think it's certainly possible that, uh, that the Russians respond as they already have against weapons depots in Ukraine, it's probably not out of the question that at some point the Russians may strike a target, a weapons depot uh, in and around a neighboring country like Poland. But I think to target a US military official, for example, or a diplomat would probably be a bridge too far because again, you start to move in that case from what is traditionally irregular warfare into conventional warfare by targeting a foreign government's uh, official. So I, I think it's unlikely that the Russians would directly hit back 
against the U.S. You know, again, what would be more likely if the Russians do want to hit back against the U.S. is they could operate through Iranian proxies uh, against U.S. soldiers in Iraq, for example. Um, those would be more likely responses than would be a direct Russian uh, hit against a strike against a, a U.S. military facility. And, and just to put a pin on this, because I'm realizing this as you as you say this, which is, to your point, Iran engages in irregular warfare because it is the only option on the table, given their actual capabilities. I mean, to make this clear, they're still flying F-14s that we that we had given to Iran when it was still under the shot, and that's something exactly. like and, that's and, like, and Bradleys and, yes. and Bradley tanks that the U.S. provided during the Shah period. Yeah, so like that's the, so when we say like. Once again, this is a large country, relatively speaking. So when we say they do not have the conventional military, they are using a like Cold War antique era military that, by the way, did not perform particularly impressively during the Iran-Iraq war. So they have no choice but to engage in regular warfare. But something that would limit Putin's ability to strike back against the U.S. is we are using regular warfare now, but we are also conventionally strong. There was very little that the Iranians – I mean, actually, what, what, what were the risks – then, given given the strike, right? So the, so the concern was there was strike. So the risk wasn't that, oh no, the Iranians will launch an invasion with their conventional army and kick us out of the Middle East. That wasn't the risk. What was the risk then when it came to making the decision on um, having him killed? Well, the risks were several fold. One is the US had, and still has to some degree, uh, a footprint. I mean, at the time in January of 2020, the US had a footprint in the Middle East that included some US forces in Lebanon in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and across the Persian Gulf. Uh, in a number of these places, uh, the Iranians have uh, Shia partners or proxies, as well as intelligence and military operatives that could conduct sabotage, assassination operations. Uh, or you know, they could use uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, Hezbollah has conducted attacks globally, frankly. So the risk in this case was that and, and, and second, that uh, the U.S. has had pretty large scale attacks conducted in Lebanon during the Reagan administration against U.S. soldiers. So really the risk was that soldiers in one of those locations, who could be political leaders, would then be uh, targeted. There were rockets fired at U.S. bases in Iraq immediately following the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. I don't believe that those uh, were the long-term, that was the long-term Iranian reaction. My general sense is that the uh, Iranians at a time and a location of their choosing will eventually strike back against the US and avenge the death of Qasem Soleimani. They've conducted attacks in Latin America. They've had plots including to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington DC at a cafe. They've conducted attacks in Africa, in the Persian Gulf, more broadly in the Middle East and South Asia. So the broader concern is that at some point, somewhere, that we may see what we've seen in the past is a strike against U.S. forces operating. Again, not directly. It may be Hezbollah. It may be a new group that is established that we identify that has close ties to the Quds Force, the ROGC Quds Force, but that is the danger. So for this last bit, I want to talk about a piece that you conveniently released um, on the day of publication of when they recorded this episode in, in Time Magazine, where you're talking about how, how Ukraine can win. And leading into that, it seems to me if there's a critique of the Russian strategy, it's that the irregular strategy that you're describing Crimea onwards is just very successful. So the, the sanction counter doesn't work. Um, there's obviously like this low level warfare um, or not low level if you're Ukrainian, but from the perspective of like outside NATO partners, low level warfare. And then they flip the switch to conventional and it seems as everything starts. And once again, there's the debate about how poorly they're doing, but it doesn't seem like this is as successful as the previous strategy. So is there this, and the, you, there's not gonna be a direct answer to this. I'm not expecting a direct answer, but you know, you reference people's wars and Maoism in in in, in the in the piece, and 
part of like Maoist guerrilla strategy is you go out into the countryside and eventually there's this like magical imperceptible moment where you then bring your forces together and seize the cities. Is, is the basic issue here that the Russians miscalculated when the proper time to shift from a regular to regular warfare? Is, is that like a metric that makes sense to think about? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the, here's the basic challenge is that in 2014, the Russians adopted what would be a classic irregular strategy in Ukraine. That is, they did not send uh, conventional forces across the border, at least in any meaningful numbers, uh, to uh, take back territory and potentially even to overthrow the uh, U- uh, Ukrainian government in Kyiv. Instead, they started an insurgency. They, they uh, provided assistance to non-state actors in Eastern Ukraine, including in the Donbass, uh, who then fought the Ukrainian military. The challenge was that they didn't, at the end of the day, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, never really expanded territorial control. Ukrainians actually did a pretty good job of keeping them contained to the Donetsk and the Luhansk areas. So I think based on the failure of an irregular approach, what Vladimir Putin concludes by 2021 is that the Ukrainians continue to be cut, to move day by day much more closely to the West. Uh, you know, they're asking for NATO membership, EU membership, and every day that goes by uh, is a day that the, the Ukrainians by now under Zelensky uh, are moving westward. And so the irregular campaign doesn't work. So instead, what Putin does, and again, it's not clear who supported this, even from within his military, whether this was you know, Grasimov that strongly supported I doubt it because this would be a huge change from what Grasimov had been arguing for the previous two decades. What the Russians do instead is that they go conventional. And the only way a conventional operation in a country like this is gonna be successful is some combination of things. You go in really, really big, which the Russians don't do. Their force to population ratio is about four Russian soldiers to a thousand Ukrainians, which is tiny. In most cases, you're looking at 20, 25, 30 foreign soldiers to a thousand inhabitants. In the US case in Germany, it was 101 US soldiers in the US sector of Germany by the end of the war to stabilize and hold territory. Um, or, or you assume that by sending Russian forces in that the government just collapses or you can kill Zelensky uh, or that the Russian, the Ukrainian population will rise up against their government. Uh, whatever the, the Russian government's calculations were along these lines, it was, they, were, they were wrong. The Ukrainian population never rose up against uh, against the uh, uh, their government. Uh, the the Russians weren't able to su- succeed quickly against uh, a conventional Ukrainian forces. So it it clearly has been a terrible decision to conduct a conventional war in Ukraine that is backed by a Western weapons. So what we may see eventually is the Russians now resorting back to an irregular campaign mm-hmm. where they're bringing in private military uh, contractors like the Wagner Group, where they're going back to supporting uh, the, Ukraine, uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian non-state uh, actors that are getting assistance from the Russians and maybe using very limited Russian conventional forces in selective small areas like in the East, uh, which then... Um, limits their casualties because the casualties that the Russians have suffered right now are, are unsustainable. 15,000 or so, 10 to 15,000 fatalities, which is what they lost in 10 years of Afghanistan. 30 to 40,000 total casualties, so 10 to 15,000 fatalities, 30 to 40,000 casualties. Those are like Afghan numbers over 10 years, but now in one month only of Ukraine. So I, I think what we're likely to see over the long run is a probably a shift back to an irregular approach uh, because Putin can't continue to lose at this to these number of regular forces. He, he'll be overthrown. So here's the 
last sum up question, the, the piece specifically discusses Ukrainian victory. And in the irregular war context, this idea of victory is actually kind of fascinating if you think about it, because does victory mean Putin gives up forward movement? Is it victory when they give up trying to encircle Kyiv? Is it victory when you take back Crimea? Because that doesn't seem to be at all on the table. Does victory mean it just it, it all, actually it seems like as if a big problem for Putin is that there was no actual way to accomplish victory as defined by his own terms. But when you're advocating for policies to create a Ukrainian victory, um, obviously a lot of this is up to the Ukrainians themselves. But what how how should we just think of this idea of victory in this weird context? Well, I think a big part of victory in this case is the uh, continuation of a Ukrainian government uh, that is not a puppet regime of Moscow or uh, whose territory is annexed, at least major territory annexed, um, because the the Russians sent military forces and maneuver units into Kiev and towards Kiev to overthrow the government. They have not been successful. So victory in part, I think, means you push those Russian forces back, uh, that they're not able to take the capital, the government is not overthrown. Um, it's certainly possible that there will be, and I think it's likely, there will continue to be fighting at various points of the East. But if the Ukrainians continue to have a functioning government and a capital, and the Russians have to back down, uh, and withdraw most of their forces, that I think is a huge victory because uh, that means that they have spoiled the strategic Russian objectives in Ukraine, which, is, which, is, um, which was to overthrow the, the, the government and, to, and to, to create a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. And, and, and so far anyway, they failed. And that, that the ability to sustain that would be some element of victory. Yeah, I think uh, just to wrap this, I think the key takeaway from what you just said is there's because there's been this very on Twitter, very non-expert debate around, oh, like how can you claim the Ukrainians are, are, are winning? You know, Putin could take this, this and that way. But the key, you really defined victory in political terms. Um, and, and this is where the Klaus Switch part is useful in the sense that like war is politics by other means. The, the, the point of a conventional war in Putin's own term was to overthrow Kiev, was to overthrow the regime. And let's say he gets to keep Crimea, let's say he keeps the, the breakaway republics, that was status quo. That was actually something that was achieved through a regular warfare. Absolutely. So the question would be, wait, what actually, okay, so this is actually good. The question, not for you, but just in general is, what actually has this conventional war accomplished beyond solidifying NATO behind Ukraine and frankly just besmirching Russia's reputation as a first rate conventional power. That, that, that's just my takeaway from everything that you're saying. Well, I mean, it is important to note that this war is likely far from over. The Russians failed miserably in the first phase of the Chechen war from 94 to 96, and then came back in 1999 and spent a decade actually turning things around and overrunning a, what was a reasonably well-armed opposition movement in Chechnya. They've continued to fight for seven years in Syria and done reasonably well. We're only a month into this, but at least after a month, the primary Russian objectives are to unify NATO, to, uh, to actually increase the military relationship between uh, Ukraine and the West, probably to deepen economic ties between Ukraine and the West and, and, and to politically, economically, and militarily weaken Russia. I mean, really in, in economically uh, uh, weaken uh, the, the Russian economy, politically isolate it. We don't see the Russian soccer team or football team playing in the World Cup this year. They have been banned. Um, and, and obviously we see a, a Russian military that has struggled. So none of Putin's strategic objectives uh, he has succeeded in achieving. And in fact, quite the opposite, that, uh, that everything he wanted to, to do in Ukraine for the most part, or most of the things uh, have actually gotten worse rather than better. Okay, so here's the actual real last question then though. You bring up the Chechen example and you bring up the Syrian example. 
in terms of the prolonged state of those wars. But in both those cases, the political objective was still achievable. So in the case of Chechnya, the political objective is at whatever cost, don't have a breakaway Russian Republic exist in the Russian Federation breakup. In Syria, it's barbaric, it's brutal, but it's Bashar al-Assad remains in control of the country. How long can this war continue in the face of unachievable political objectives? That'd be my real last question for you. Well, I think that, uh, that the, this war, the way it's being fought cannot be sustained by the Russians uh, for a lot longer. They, at least they can't lose these numbers of Russian soldiers at this pace but the war can continue if it shifts largely to an irregular war. And we see Ukrainian backed by the Russian military and intelligence services fighting maybe with bigger weapon systems. Um, and you know that can occur in perpetuity. I mean, Russia borders Ukraine. So the Russians can mm-hmm. continue to pour weapons into into Ukraine for the foreseeable future. So I, this, this war could burn just unlikely at a conventional level, unless there are wild cards. Mm-hmm. If, it's an interesting question. If the leadership of Ukraine is killed, how will that country respond? Uh, one of the things that has been fascinating about watching Ukraine is how charismatic Zelensky in particular has been in bringing the West to support his country, but will he? He has raised the prospects multiple times of he may not make it through at the end of the day, the week, the month. So there are wild card scenarios where Ukraine suffers significant challenges, uh, including political ones. So again, I I don't I don't think we've seen the the last of this. I think we've probably seen the peak of, at this point anyway, of a large Russian conventional footprint trying to fight this way. That's great. Seth, thank you so much for coming on the show. Could you just, people, this helps move books better. Just shout out the book, Three Dangerous Men in Your Own Words, not just mine. (laughs) The book is Three Dangerous Men, and it looks at irregular warfare from the perspective of uh, China, Russia, and Iran. How, do, how are they thinking about competing with the United States? And how are they thinking about weakening the U.S.? And at the end, how should the U.S. then, in that context, think about what competition actually means going forward? Excellent. Thanks for joining us on The Realignment. Thank you very much for having me.